together. Ah, man, how the hell do you fit these? Oh, uh, hey guys, uh, just give me two seconds. I'm, I'm trying to fit on Nami's bikini right now, and it's really tight, and I'm not used to these sort of things, obviously. All right, all right, I think I got it, I think I got it. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, big reveal in three, two, one. Ah, fuck you, no. Um, you have to raise the stakes maybe a little bit more before I get to that point. Maybe if I ever do that charity drive I thought about, maybe we'll have like a dollar amount where I'll, uh, I'll try on Nami's bikini. I don't know why you guys wanted me to do that, but okay. Anyway, uh, welcome to the discussion video of our glorious Nami Swan from One Piece. Gotta, gotta watch the weeb levels that are reaching critical mass at this point. I did not buy this figurine either. Someone just sent it to me, I swear. Uh, um, but first, let's get the most important thing out of the way. For everybody that's watching this video that's just waiting for me to talk about her tits, here's a time code. Have fun. Although, it's going to be more than just me talking about her knockers for five minutes. It's going to be about me delving into the real purpose behind her knockers for five minutes. Okay, but that's not what we're starting off with. Let's begin with her backstory. Yeah. Let's start with her, uh, her background. Okay. So, uh, Nami is actually an orphan. Yeah, kind of sad. In fact, Nami originates the very sad sort of straw hat backstory sort of thing. You know how, like, all the backstories of the Straw Hats are usually pretty damn depressing? Yeah, that pretty much all started with Nami. Not to say that there wasn't depressing stories before her, but at the time when hers was revealed, that took the cake. I would say the two most depressing Straw Hat uh, backgrounds would be Brooks and Robbins. I think Brook is the one that's the most depressing, but Robbins is also up there too. Um, other Straw Hats, they usually have somebody that died in their past, like Usopp lost his mom, Sanji lost his mom, you know, uh, Luffy thought, you know, his, his uh, brother died, and then his brother actually did die. Um, but uh, yeah, that's usually just like one or two people that died. Nami's was... Way worse than that when we first found out about it. So, Nami was found on the battlefield uh, along with her uh, adoptive sister, Nojiko. They're not actually blood related. They were found on the battlefield by a Marine at the time her, whose name was Belmere. And Belmere, uh, she didn't have children of her own. She lived on Kokoyashi Village. She was a Marine. We do not know what her rank was at the time, though. She uh, rescued Nami and Nojiko. Nojiko was a little bit older. She was like a toddler. Nami was a baby at the time. And so she brought them back to Kokoyashi Village. They were, it was the middle of a storm, they were sick, and so she gave them over to the doctor there, and, you know, he, you know, fixed them up or whatever, and then they just, there, there was actually an orphanage on, um, in, in Kokoyashi Village that they could have, you know, grown up at, um, but Belmere decided to raise them herself, which a lot of the other people on the island thought was a little bit odd, because Belmere was, didn't have a lot of money, they were rather poor, so the idea of her raising two kids seemed a little bit odd, but, you know, I think she always just wanted to be a mom, and it was never really stated anything why she she wasn't a mom before this, but, you know, she might have had problems having kids, or there might have been an issue with a guy or something, I don't know, but she wanted to be a mom, so that's why she adopted Nami and Nojiko, and like I said, they lived a rather poor life on the island, they had a, a little house, and they had a tangerine plantation, uh, which, by the way, I guess tangerines are out of season right now, because couldn't find any of them anywhere, so I just had to go with oranges, so I'm sorry. Um, but I, I know there was some tangerine experts that were probably gonna, you know, those aren't actually tangerine teching, those are oranges, right? I'm like, yes, I know. But, yeah, they, they lived, uh, you know, a pretty decent life, you know, they, they simply, but okay. Um, the, the issue was on Kokoyashi Village, you know, there was a lot of other, you know, it was like a tropical kind of island, so there was a lot of other plantations that had, uh, tangerines and stuff, so even though they had a really good, you know, farm and a harvest, you know, they, you know, they, they had to compete with other people. But, you know, they lived very simply. Uh, Nami's dream ever since since she was a child was uh, cartography. She was really interested in drawing maps and reading books about navigation. Uh, at one point, she even uh, stole a book to read about navigation because she knew that Belmere couldn't pay for it because of how poor they were. Um, but Belmere was very uh, supportive of Nami and always wanted her to grow up to fulfill her dream of drawing a map of the world, which is the dream that she carries throughout the story of One Piece. Although, we don't really see her, uh, you know, uh, stay up up to date with that dream. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that, of course, she's keeping track of all the different islands she's on and stuff like that, and she is keeping up with drawing maps, but we don't actually see her do that. We don't actually see her, like, 
after she gets to Alabasta, we don't see her drawing a map of Alabasta or, you know, whatever. Let's just, let's just ignore the fact that, you know, cartography and, and surveying and stuff like that requires a lot more than just being on the island. You actually have to, like, you know, go around the island, figure out, you know, the shape of it, how big it is, and shit like that, so... You know, whatever. She's, she, it's fine though. I think, I think more often than not, and more, nothing than anything, she wants to just be the first person to have a complete map of the Grand Line. Maybe not like, you know, here is, you know, the layout of every single island, but once you start getting into the New World and you start getting into places that explorers have never journeyed before other than Gold Roger, that's when you get to the mysterious realm that she, you know, could draw maps of those islands and then, you know, that, that that's her goal, you know, to go to the far off places that haven't been explored yet and be the first one to chart locations for that sort of stuff. Uh, her sister, Nojiko, I don't... I don't recall her ever being really interested in anything. I mean, she was also very supportive, Nami, being a, a navigator, being a, a, someone that would draw maps of uh, the world. But I don't remember Nojiko being interested in anything herself, I'm, other than just growing up and then taking over the plantation after Bellamere. Um, it's also important to mention that after uh, Bellamere becomes the mother, the adoptive mother of Nami and Nojiko, I think she stops being a marine at that point. So, everything seems to be going good. I mean, they're poor, but everything's fine. And then the fishmen attack. So, um, yeah, there was a guy named Ar- you might have heard about this story. So there was a guy named Arlong who used to be part of the Sun Pirates with Fisher Tiger, and then Fisher Tiger got betrayed by a bunch of humans and got shot, and Arlong got really pissed at humanity, and I guess, uh, you know, he had a fight with Jinbei, and, uh, basically Jinbei beat the shit out of him, and, uh, he left to the East Blue, mostly because Arlong is kind of a, a coward, in a sense, and he probably realized that he wasn't strong enough to rule over Fishman Island, or the New World, or even the Grand- the first half of the Grand Line, so Arlong decides to take his followers and just go to the East Blue and then rule that place. The East Blue being, like, the weakest of the four seas, so it really is quite literally like a big fish in a small pond sort of thing, uh, where Arlong is, you know, not that strong compared to, like, the other fishmen. It's more of his ideology that was really dangerous that we touch upon more when we get to the Fishman Island arc, um, how Arlong's, uh, determination and, and him being kind of like the iconoclast of his, uh, uh, of, of his society really created characters like Hody and the new Fishman Pirates later on, but that's 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 Arlong's character. We're talking about Nami here. Arlong arrives with his crew of like really strong fishmen. Fishmen just by default are about ten times stronger than humans, and they you know they can resist gunfire and and you know stabbing attacks and stuff like that. And these are just normal humans that live on this island. So they showed up. And they basically uh, issued a payment for each person on the island uh, in order to stay there, you know, in order, well, basically in order to not die. Uh, protection money, essentially. Every adult had to hand over 100 million berries. And, or was it 100,000? I believe it was 100,000, because 100 million is on a whole other level. It was 100,000, yeah. Every adult had to pay 100,000, every child 50,000. And if you couldn't pay, if you if you can't pay the cash, then you're out with the trash. Ha ha ha. So, yeah, he fucking caps your ass, though. He kills you. Um, so, when it got to Bellamere, uh, there was actually a situation where they almost got away scot-free, because Bellamere wasn't listed at having children. And so she had uh, her life savings scratched together. She had 100,000 berries that could be used to pay for her. Nami and Nojiko were not at the house at the time, so they might have been able to squeak by with this. But because Bellamere was probably aware that these fishmen were going to hang around for a while on the island, and, you know, if they found out that Nami and Nojiko, they would have to live in hiding. And if they were ever discovered, then that would be it. They would be killed on the spot. So, Belmere is the one that says, you know, take the 100,000, but that's not for me, that's for my daughter. So, 50,000 for Nojiko, 50,000 for Nami. And so, with that being the case, you know, Belmere stands up to freaking Arlong, points a freaking shovel, I mean, gun, yeah, gun, in his freaking mouth and tries to kill him, but, you know, he's Arlong, so he just crushes the damn thing. Um, and it results in Belmere being shot and killed and she's cr as she's cradling her, her um, children. So, yeah, that is... And, oh, it doesn't stop there. I mean, that's depressing, sure, but it doesn't stop there. But already, that's a pretty sad kind of backstory, you know? Like, and Bellamere gets fucked up, too, by Arlong. Before she gets shot, I mean, she gets her freaking arm mangled by him and just gets the crap beaten out of her while everyone is just kind of standing on and watching and they can't do anything. And, and you know, and, and so she gets shot, she dies, and then they notice that Nami is really good at drawing maps, 
So the, Arlong viewed like, oh, wow, this person can be really useful to us. So they kidnap Nami, take her back to her, to their like base of operations, Arlong Park. And they let her go back to the village, but they branded her with uh, their mark, the Arlong Pirates Tattoo. And they employed her as basically their navigator. So they're going to be work. She's going to be working for them and drawing maps for their own needs to kind of like eventually conquer these surrounding islands and eventually the East Blue. Um, Arlong doesn't get that far with that though, because this happened when Nami was a child. She was 18 at the beginning of the story when Luffy and Zoro meet her. She was 18, so she was probably like I don't know seven or eight when Arlong invaded, and Arlong didn't really make a lot of progress in conquering the East Blue. He got kind of lazy after a while, um, but he also proposes a deal to Nami. He says, tell you what, if you can get me a hundred million berries, then I will sell Kokoyashi Village to you, and then you can, you can do whatever you want with it. So they made a deal, and you understand, when Nami first appears... It seems like she's just obsessed with money. Like, she's just like, oh, I love money because cause I'm a pirate. All the gold just gets me so freaking wet. No, it's really depressing because the whole source of her, like, I mean, a little bit of it might come from the fact that she did grow up in a poor family. So there was always, like, that inherent desire to get more money because, like, if we can just get more money, then we would have a better life and I could spend it with Nojiko and my mom, Bellamere. So there might be a little bit of it from that. But you have to understand, for like, throughout most of her childhood, throughout her teenage years, she was driven by this ultimate goal of eventually avenging her mother by all she had, getting all the money she could get her hands on, a hundred million berries, and then she could uh, free her village from the tyranny of Arlong. So you'd think like much of her, like, like even after Luffy defeats Arlong, she still has that. And that's kind of like a part of her character, kind of like the quirky aspect, kind of like how Sanji is like, you know, kind of like a, a chivalrous ladies man. You know, Luffy likes meat. Nami likes the gold, you know, so it stays with her after that, which, you know, would make sense if she was dedicated throughout the, the, her whole life, you know, being obsessed with money on that level. It's not just going to go away. So it's kind of treated more as just like a quirky thing that her character does, but it has its roots in some really dark places. But I think the major thing you have to take away from it is that with Nami's greed before Arlong Park, it was very clearly like, like she would betray and step on how many people she had to step on in order to get her hands on some money. After the events of Arlong Park, she still loves money and will do almost anything to get her hands on it, but she always puts the lives of her crew and her friends first before the cold hard cash. She was actually the third most intelligent person, period, all throughout the East Blue. Uh, ben Beckman of Shanks crew being the first, the most intelligent, and then uh, Captain Kuro of the Black Cat Pirates being the second. So uh, this intelligence does carry on later on when we get to her relationships with the crew. Uh, but yeah, so using these, uh, using her intelligence and her thievery, her, her skills, she uh, went around the East Blue robbing the fuck out of pirates, uh, basically. Uh, eventually, she got to Buggy's uh, uh, crew. Uh, she stole a map of the Grand Line from Buggy, and she was going to rob him, you know, dry, until that's at the same time when she met Luffy, and the events of the story and her getting, uh, you know, tied with the Straw Hats, you know, kicking into high gear there, which we'll get into when we talk about, you know, the, the present storyline there. Um, but yeah, that, that's her, uh, that's her story. And, and all the other members of the Kokuyashi village, they turned on her almost immediately, which I found kind of weird. You know, she shows back up to the Kokoyashi village after Arlong brands her with the tattoo and, you know, she's like crying almost. And she's like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work for Arlong now. And Nojiko's like, oh, how dare you? You freaking don't care about our mom. Even though, I mean, come on, guys, it's it's very obvious this fucking child is being manipulated by the fishmen for her own devices or possibly brainwashed. Nah, screw it. She's just a, she's a backstabbing, money-grubbing bitch. That's all she is. It, I mean, come on now, guys. Genzo is, I think, all right. I think Genzo still, and Nojiko also to a level after Nojiko got a little older, she, you know, kind of maybe understood what was going on. Genzo was like the sheriff of the village, and his trademark was a pinwheel, which is hence, you know, that's another symbol that Nami is, uh, you know, connected to along with the tangerines thing. Um, but going on to her position on the crew, Nami probably has, uh, probably like next to Frankie and Sanji, the most uh, valuable position on the Straw Hats. 
Uh, and it's in the sense that it's one of those things that you need to have absolutely or you're going to die very quick on the sea. And that is she is the navigator. Navigator! Um, and she is on top of that also a very commanding presence on the ship. I said in Zoro's video that Zoro being the first mate doesn't actually do anything in terms of like ordering people around or anything like that. Uh, Luffy does that a little bit being the captain, but pretty much when they're sailing around on the Thousand Sunny or the Going Merry, it's, it's Nami that's in charge. She's the one that tells them, you know, Luffy's the one that sets the, I guess the ultimate destination much to Nami's jargon sometimes when it's like, Hey, Look at that island over there that has a giant swirling vortex over it and I can see a giant monster in the distance. Let's go there! And and Nami's like, let's not, please. But, you know, all the other crew members are like, yeah, sure, let's go there. You know, whatever. And Nami's like, okay, fine. So I guess Luffy's the one that sets the ultimate destination and they'll follow Luffy as the captain. But, you know, beyond that... The route they take and how they uh, fare against the weather and how they maneuver the ship itself. Nami is essentially the commander-in-chief. She's the acting captain when the shit gets live. Going beyond just navigating stuff, just like, you know, tip the mainsails to the starboard side or something like that. She also is responsible for getting the crew off their asses when they're lazing around. Whenever Zoro is, like, snoozing on the deck or whenever, you know, Usopp and Chopper are just fooling around or something like that or Frankie's up to his hentai perverted ways and, you know, and then, you know, Nami is uh, very gifted with navigation to the point she's very in tune with the weather to the point where she can like you know the weather on the grand line is sporadic as all hell and one of the cool things about nami's character is she'll just be sitting around you know reading a book or you know taking a bath or whatever and she'll be like oh this is nice there's a giant vortex coming at nine o'clock in exactly 16 minutes everybody get ready <laughs> so um she's like she's she's very attuned to like uh barometric pressure and temperature and the wind and she can notice just the subtle differences in these different aspects of the climate and she can determine you know what's going to hit what direction it's going to hit and what you have to do to avoid it and she's like okay crew get off your ass Zoro put the freaking sake cup down chopper quit messing around with that baby bird we got shit to do you know if you don't want to die listen to me uh, and, and it would make sense, you know, Luffy was very dedicated to Nami when uh, rescuing her throughout our long park arc, not just because, you know, uh, of her navigating skills, but because she's, you know, she, she's uh, her, his friend, but Luffy also brings up a line that's like, you know, Nav Nami is my navigator and I will have no one else. She's the only navigator I will have on my ship as King of the Pirates. So he, she is certainly very worthy of that. Um... Oda once said, somebody asked Oda a question once, uh, how would the Straw Hats be structured as a family? And of course, at this point, I think uh, Brooke was, I, I, either Brooke was a member or he was added later. Anyway, uh, it was listed like Frankie would be the father, uh, Robin the mother, Nami the daughter, and then all the other Straw Hats were like sons. Eventually, Brooke was the grandfather figure. But before Robin... It's, it's really Nami that was, like, the mother of the crew, you know? She was the one that really brought it all together and, you know, and, and managed to get places, you know, and actually, you know, fulfill their roles as pirates. Probably even more valuable because, yeah, I mean, Sanji's the cook. You need to have proper nutrition, although Nami is actually a fairly decent cook herself, although she charges you, like, out the ass if you actually want her to cook, but... Whatever, fine. She's a decent cook. Um, she was essentially the cook, by the way, before uh, Sanji joined up. And Frankie, Frankie's role is important too because you got to keep the ship in condition. But none of that is none of that matters if you can't get to the next island or if you can't. You're completely, you know, useless in the water. You're dead on. You're dead on arrival essentially if you don't have a navigator. Um, so let's get to her relationships with the crew members. Uh, also something I noticed, and I realized this as soon as I started doing this, you know, every video I want to go through the Straw Hats relationships with the other Straw Hats, but then you start thinking like, okay, my first, like, like last videos was Zoro. So I did Zoro and Nami's relationship here. So the further I go down, I would have, you know, more or less already have discussed the Straw Hats relationship. So this segment is going to get shorter and shorter as we go. You know, because I've already mentioned, you know, Nami's relationship to Zoro and Brooke and Usopp already. So just expect them to get, you know, shorter and shorter as we go along. The last Straw Hats that I'm going to discuss here will be Frankie number eight. And then uh, Sanji will be the last one. And then Vivi. Vivi will be like a bonus. So I might not even really mention their relationships all that much at that point. Or it might only be like a few sentences because I've already kind of talked about it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So going into Nami and Luffy. So... 
Upon first meeting them, uh, Nami being extremely intelligent and Luffy like, okay, Luffy is not stupid. Battle-wise, he's extremely intelligent. He's good at thinking on his feet, but he lacks street smarts. He lacks, you know, you know how how to read a situation. You know, like it's like, hey, let's just charge right in and attack the main boss. Maybe we could be sneaky or something. Nah, let's just go do it. So when they first met, uh, Nami is being chased by Buggy's crew to get the map back that she stole. And then Luffy uh, just crashes right down in front of her. Long story, giant bird that picked him up or whatever. She, so Luffy just lands right in front of her. And Nami, being super intelligent, was just like, Oh, hey boss, how you doing? Oh yeah, uh, thanks for telling me to, you know, like basically pinning it on Luffy. Like Luffy is her boss. And now Buggy's crew is going to, you know, be distracted while beating the shit out of somebody that she thought was really weak while she manages to get a clean getaway. I mean, she comes up with this plan like immediately after seeing Luffy, like playing the field to her advantage. You know, once again, very similar to being her navigate navigation skills reading the situation at a drop of the hat and then making a split second decision that is beneficial to her so then so yeah she tre treats luffy pretty much as just a pawn at first um eventually after the fight with um oh my pinwheel fell eventually after fighting uh buggy's crew and coming out victorious nami realizing that luffy is actually pretty strong um luffy asks her to join her his crew to which she agrees earlier on in the east blue though it's important to mention that nami wasn't really a true member of the Straw Hats, rather that she was using them as a means to an end. Remember, up to this point in the story, Nami's whole deal was going throughout the East Blue, robbing pirates left and right. That's what she has been doing for years. So the Straw Hat pirates, which weren't even really a proper pirate crew at this point, you just had uh, Luffy and Zoro, Nami was the third to join, so she thought, okay, we can, I can bum around with these guys, and if they manage to get any treasure, then I'll just steal it under their noses. Uh, so that was pretty much how she viewed Luffy at the beginning there. Upon the Arlong Park arc, after uh, Nami steals the Going Merry, goes back to Arlong Park, just pretty much like, like okay, um, thanks Luffy, thanks Zoro, thanks Usopp, whatever, it's been a blast later, bye. Um, she probably, she did have fun. She did have fun on their crew on the brief time that she had it there. And that was kind of, uh, that kind of messed with her because she never really got, she never really connected with anybody while she was out there stealing shit. It was always superficial, but the first time she really had fun on a pirate crew, that was with, that was with Luffy and Zoro. And then she had also taught her that not all pirates are evil fucks like Arlong was. So she didn't expect Luffy and them to follow her. She didn't expect them to go all the way to that just insane lengths to go to Arlong Park and save her ass because she figured, oh, they're going to find out that I was just, I backstabbed them. Therefore, they're just going to immediately, you know, think like, fuck her. And then they're just going to leave her be. Uh, but no, Luffy goes to the insane degrees of following her to Arlong Park. And it really is a difficult time for Nami because the entire time she has to put up this attitude of, you know, I'm a cold, heartless bitch that wants to kill all of you, when in reality, she it was genuinely concerned about their well-being. She actually does not want Luffy, Zoro, or Usopp to be injured or killed, even if that means she has to pretend to kill Usopp in order to make sure Usopp isn't killed. And the most emotional moment is, of course, when Nami is in the village on her knees crying uh, after she, you know, just breaks down from all the crap. This was after Arlong went back on her on his word. Uh, you know, go, go figure, you can't trust the, the merman that's literally like Pinocchio with the giant nose. Um, but yeah, so, you know, she, he takes all the money that she raised, the hundred million berries, and, uh, just, you know, pretends like nothing ever happened. So she can't get her village back. So she's still on the crew and she realizes that Arlong was such a backstabber, takes up a fucking knife and, uh, her Arlong tattoos on her, you know, her left shoulder and just begins to stab it you know, repeatedly, like, Arlong, 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 and then Luffy grabs it, grabs a knife, she drops it, and she's like, Luffy, what are you doing? And then, so Luffy just takes off his hat, puts it on her, and uh, shouts to the heavens, like, he's gonna pay that fishman bastard! And uh, so, that was really the moment where she breaks down, and she stops viewing Luffy as just an idiot or someone that she can exploit or someone that's just mindlessly following her, you know, and that's annoying. She looks to Luffy and she's like, Luffy, help me. Please help me. And so Luffy being Luffy, 
without even a freaking thought, without even a you know a moment's hesitation, jumps on the bandwagon, gets the crew together, and goes to beat the ever-loving fuck out of Arlong, which he succeeds, and then Nami officially joins the crew. So, I mean, that moment right there probably is the highlight of the East Blue arc, of the East Blue saga, I guess I should say, from everything from the start of the story. And I have to feel like that moment had to have a big impact on the fans, because Arlong was sort of like the final boss of the East Blue, you know, and it wasn't as simple. Well, it was simple to the point of just going up to the big bad guy in the arc and then beating the shit out of him. But this was unlike what happened with Don Krieg or with Buggy or with Kuro. Nami at this point has been established as a character since like uh, the first 10 chapters of the story. And uh, so at this point when they arrive at Arlong, you know, she's a character that we kind of know about already. And we find about her, her history and how Arlong has fucked her over. And I really think this is one of the major points in the story when the fans really got into One Piece, where they really started realizing, damn, this is this is a pretty solid manga. And so after this, pretty much, I mean, there's Log Town, but then after that, they jump pretty much the Grand Line, which is where it really gets it gets on there. Uh, also, I should mention that those uh, scenes at the beginning of the anime, remember when Nami was, uh, you know, on that cruise ship and she was uh, trying to, you know, steal from the cruise ship? That was all the anime. That was not the manga at all. They introduced, I think, her earlier in the anime because there was, like, a lack of characters. You know, here, here's here's some more characters to, like, fill out your palette and stuff like that. Uh, but, yeah, she only really appeared in the manga when she was being chased by Buggy's crew and then Luffy crashed down. That's when she made her first appearance there. Uh, so her next relationship with Zoro, uh, somebody brought up when I mentioned her relationship with Zoro last time, I kind of glossed over this and when they brought it up, here's the comment right here, but they brought up how, uh, Nami and Zoro sort of have like a, um, like an old couple sort of relationship. And then I'm thinking about that for a little bit and I'm like, yeah, it is kind of a little bit, uh, particularly since when they bicker back and forth whenever they're paired together. But also you have the scenes where uh, Nami bribes Zoro a lot, and uh, there's moments when... Um, I, I forgot to mention this in the Zoro video, but when Zoro went to go buy his katanas in Logtown, uh, he got the money from Nami. And this is kind of a, like a running gag throughout the earlier arcs of like the Grand Line and stuff like that. Whenever, uh, you know, Nami brings up to Zoro, like, you still owe me money plus like 300% interest, interest or whatever out the ass amount that Nami charges. Uh, so yeah, she, she lent the money so Zoro can get his swords. Even though actually he didn't actually pay for the swords, he gives the money to Nami back. But Nami's like, oh no, that's not good enough. You owe me interest. So yeah, that's kind of a funny thing there. Uh, but they get paired up with Al in Alabasta. They fight against uh, Mrs. Doublefinger and Mr. One. And uh, even though Nami is viewed as probably one of the more weaker members of the crew at this point, Zoro, I feel like, has a little bit of uh, you know hope in her that he, she could actually win, even though that Mrs. Doublefinger is a Devil Fruit user and stuff like that. He has a little bit of confidence that Nami will be able to win this, that she'll be able to hold her own there. So uh, that, that was a really good moment there. Uh, moving on to Usopp, which I also mentioned in the Usopp video, so you can just go back and check those out there. Um, they're viewed as one of the more weaker members of the Straw Hat Pirates before the time skip. Uh, Nami actually has this moment where she comes to Usopp during the Alabasta arc uh, in, the, in the Going Merry when they're en route there and basically says, you know, we're pretty weak but at least you have, like, you, you're, you're gadgety. You can come up with weapons and stuff like that. Could you make me a weapon, Usopp? And that is when they invent, uh, Usopp invents the climb attack, her major weapon, which we'll get to later. Uh, but that's really how she fights, period. Like, up until this point, Nami used, like, a three-section, like, bow staff that she kept on her hip. She can, like, take out and, like, attach the sides together. So she was pretty good at, like, pole arm fighting. Um, but it was really through Usopp that she got the weapon that allowed her to contend with the stronger characters throughout the story, many of which were Devil Fruit users or, like, uh, the six power wielders or stuff like that. She can actually stand with the best of them. I mean, don't get me wrong, she won't be able to stand up against, like, a really major opponent, although she did contend with Eneru for a little bit. You know, even the, the shitty climb attack was able to throw Eneru off guard and managed to block a lightning strike from Eneru that might have easily killed her. 
you know, and so, hey, even though it was, like, more of, like, the, the first version of the climb attack that Usopp gave her was essentially just a party trick uh, sort of thing, like, a like thing for that, uh, it was still able to, uh, you know, capable of a few tricks, and Nami being an expert weather, uh, you know, expert navigator and expert of the weather, she was able to turn it into something that was actually fairly a weapon. Later on, she gets upgrades to the climb attack that are actually more deadly on their own, but uh, it, it goes to show that even with, like, a shitty party trinket that Usopp gave her, she was able to turn that into something something that was pretty useful. So who's next? Uh, Sanji. Okay. So uh, Sanji is completely love struck by Nami. In fact, I feel like Nami is one of the major reasons why Sanji like joined Luffy's crew. Like, yeah, going out to sea and finding the all blue and living your dream. Yeah, that's one thing. That's good and everything. But oh man, I also get to hang out and possibly uh, woo this uh, extremely hot redhead. Okay, all right, that, that's the one that tipped the scale. Let's be honest here. So it's an interesting relationship. If I was probably gonna ship anybody on the Straw Hats. That I would, because th that's not the kind of manga it is. It's the same thing with Bleach. It's like Oda's not pushing like a romance between the Straw Hats. That's not what he does. Um, I mean, we might get that at the very end of the story. Like they might end up together, but it's not something that they're really gonna press as like a major critical plot point here. Um, like, uh, oh, are Nami and Sanji gonna confess their feelings for each other? That's not the kind of thing that Oda does. But it's an interesting relationship that I like because. At many points in the story, it's very clear that, yes, uh, Nami might be annoyed when Sanji goes overboard with it, um, but it's very clear that Nami does care about Sanji, you know, and, you know, I, I would even say in a lot of respects, you know, even finds him very attractive in, in that sense. And uh, it's just that whenever there's, like, a serious situation going on, like, like, holy shit, here comes a typhoon, or holy shit, we're fighting this really strong person, or holy shit, we might die, in that situation, Sanji is still trying to, like, oh, my Nami's sweet, you know, you shall only just jump into my arms and I will take care of you, you know, that kind of shit. And I think that's very annoying to her, like, get your head out of the clouds, Casanova, this is kind of, this is serious here. Um... But uh, it's not like she hates being around him. It's not like she's like, oh my god, this fucking, you know, guy that's always trying to hit on me. It's not like that. And so, if I was gonna, yeah, if I was gonna ship anybody, I would say, you know, Nami and Sanji, go all the way. It's kind of obvious, because that seems like the plainly obvious thing. But I, I, I like it. I think there's a lot of stuff there. Um, and I don't even know why I'm bringing this up, because this is not, let's discuss fan fiction of all these characters. This is just a character discussion. But I'll bring it up. Uh, I've read a fair amount of uh, theories that state that Nami is, in fact, a, a, she doesn't swing that way. Nami's, in fact, a lesbian because she has a lot more in common and she has a lot more of these moments with female characters like Lola and Vivi and Robin. Uh, you know, I just, uh, once again, I don't, I don't know if Oda's trying to tell you anything there. It's, it's, it's worth, I guess, noting, uh, but... I don't know. I still feel like there's something there with Sanji, and I still feel like they would be the ones that get together. But that's 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 just me. Maybe I'm I'm the one that's too obvious. You know, it's like oh, it's the obvious thing is Sanji and Nami. It's it's really Sanji. I mean, it's it's no, it's really Sanji and Zoro. That's what Oda's going for. No, it's it's really it's really Zoro and Nami, or Usopp and Nami, or Luffy and Nami. I never got that. Luffy Luffy doesn't even think about shit like that. You know, yeah, that, that's the kind of respect there, but. Um, yeah, anyway, so, uh, the, 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 the apex, though, that I want to bring up about Nami and Sanji's relationship actually happens rather recently, uh, during Totland, when Sanji, uh, basically sacrifices himself in order to get, uh, you know, Nami and Chopper and Brooke at, into safety on Zo, and he leaves with Beijay, because he doesn't want anything to happen to them, and he's like, I'll be back. And then later, when Nami is very dedicated to going and rescuing Sanji, she's even in tears. Like, when, when Luffy and the crew arrive at Zo, she is in literal tears and hugs Luffy and, like, I'm so sorry what happened to Sanji. So she really does care about him and she wants to try to get him back. So they go to Totland to try to get him back after Sanji is revealed to be, after they run into him in that carriage and he decides to, like, you know, like, snub them keep up appearances and everything like that, because the Vin Smokes are, like, right there, keeps up appearances, like, I was never gonna run around with you fucking pirates, you know, I'm gonna stay here, I'm a fucking prince, I'm awesome! You have this moment where Nami goes up to Sanji, and you can tell that she's seriously pissed, 
Like, she doesn't find this funny. She doesn't find it a joke. She doesn't think that Sanji's kidding around. She thinks it's serious. So she walks over to Sanji, and she's like, uh, Sanji-chan. Actually, no. I mean, Sanji-kun. No. Lord Sanji. I apologize, your highness, for disrupting you or trying to care about you. And then just slaps him right in the fucking face. And, uh... Yeah, that that was a very powerful moment in the recent arc, and that's gonna be I can't I can't wait to see that scene animated because I think that's gonna be like a, like the highlight of that episode there, that very emotional moment, and uh, yeah, later on though, later on though, when it's found out that Sanji was just putting up an act and he was playing around just so you know he wouldn't get the Straw Hats in in any more danger that they already were, that they would hopefully just leave the island. I don't know why Sanji thought that would fucking work. Come on, Sanji, you see what happens. You saw what happened when Nami went to Arlong Park. You saw what happened when Robin defected. You know what happens when people on the Straw Hats defect. Luffy and the other members will t fight tooth and nail to get them back. So I don't know why you thought that, like, playing the I'm a dick angle now would suddenly make them leave. It wouldn't happen. There's just no way it would go down that way, Sanji. I'm sorry. But, uh, anyway... Uh, after they find out that Sanji's really still a nice guy, he really wants to join the crew, he's just being held against his will, Nami begins to, like, bawl her eyes out, like, oh my god, they thank you, that's such a relief, even when Sanji thought, like, oh my god, this is gonna be so embarrassing, oh my, what, how do I tell, how do I tell Nami this, and then Luffy says, it. oh, he's fine, he wants to be on our team, and, and Sanji's just like, oh, I'm waiting for it, waiting for, like, the bitch session, but then Nami and Chopper and all the other Straw Hats are just like, oh, thank god, we're good, he's still one of us. But here's the thing, though. Afterwards, Nami has a line of dialogue to Sanji, and I feel like this really cements it in that there's a deeper relationship here. She is happy Sanji's returning, but then she also says, you know, I will never forgive you for, you know, dragging me down in the depths of fear itself. I'll never forgive you for making me worry about you that much, which is why I'm then going to drag you back by force if necessary. And so... I really feel like that is, like, you don't talk that way to just somebody that's, like, your friend, even if you're going to be gone forever. I feel like there really is some some love there between the two characters. Maybe that's just the way I'm interpreting it, though. Okay, so Nami and Chopper's relationship. Well, first off, Nami pretty much owes her life to Chopper and Dr. Kureha, but, you know, Chopper helped out, too. When Nami was, you know, uh, deadly sick, and, uh, you know, she was bitten by the Kestia, which is like a tick, um, which is a very rare disease that not just anybody can cure, uh, it wasn't just up to Dr. Kureha that healed her, but also it was, like, a big issue because they had to hurry up and get to Alabasta to help Vivi out, and Dr. Kureha was like, no, you need to stay on this island for, like, 10 days in order to properly heal. It was because Chopper went with the Straw Hats and became their doctor that, you know, she was able to leave Drum Island and, you know, get out, you know, get to Alabasta on time. So, um, Nami owes a lot to Chopper. In fact, she's actually the first person to actually, I think, tell the crew that he isn't just, like, a magical talking reindeer that's hanging out with us. This guy is a doctor. He's actually going to serve a function. And it was funny because you have a scene with, uh, San, with, uh, like, Nami saying to the crew after they found out that he's a doctor, they're all awestruck. Like, whoa, Chopper, you're a doctor? Chopper's like, yeah, I guess so. And then Nami's like, what did you think he was when he joined the crew? And, uh, and, um, Luffy's just like, a magical talking reindeer. And Sanji's like, I thought he was just backup food. <laughs> you know, and so it was a thing. But, so there was a little bit of a thing between them two, especially with Luffy and Sanji trying to eat him. You know, that was a little bit of a, you know, rough thing there. Uh, but eventually the rest of the crew comes to realize that Chopper is a doctor. Nami just being the first one to really understand his talents. Um, Chopper is, like, super kawaii, of course. Uh, so Nami will constantly, you know, fawn over him, you know, whenever, you know, he's really cute and those scenes like that. Also, Chopper is the only male member of the crew that uh, Nami will let see her naked. Uh, or, uh, um, you know, take a bath with her or stuff like that, mostly because Chopper, Chopper even admitted this during Thriller Bark when, uh, Nami was taking a shower and then Usopp and, uh, uh, Chopper were outside the shower guarding it. Uh, Usopp's like, oh, you want to go take a peek? And Chopper's like, I'm not interested in Nami's butt, you idiot. I'm an animal, you know? So, you know, N Chopper might have eaten the human human fruit, but he's still an animal by nature. So he's actually not, it it's, it's completely plutonic. There's, he's not attracted to, to female. Uh, humans. I uh, know he's attracted to female reindeer, as we saw on, on Zoe there. Uh, that's an interesting thing there. Uh, after the time skip, after it was, you know, revealed that... I, I wish Chopper goes into that form a little bit more now. They can actually ride on Chopper now, because he's actually like a full 
full, you know, scale reindeer that they actually actually can ride on into battle and shit. But they, he never assumes that form, hardly ever. Um, but there was a cute moment there where like Nami's like, "Oh my God, Chopper, you're so fluffy now." That's the case. After Chopper found out on Thriller Bark that uh, Hogback was actually not like, "Don't meet your heroes," because it turns out that they're evil, sadistic fucks that go grave robbing and bringing zombies back to life that will um, corpses back to life into zombies that will uh, you will then treat like garbage. Uh, as Chopper found out with Hogback, and Nami was the one that kind of comforted him afterwards you know after was chopper was very upset after he found out the truth about the truth about hogback uh so you know nami really does genuinely care about chopper as well kind of maybe treats him more of like a child of the crew you know and and you know treats him in, in such a way as like you would treat like uh you know not not a toddler she doesn't she doesn't patronize him in fact uh during any's lobby you know there was the moment when sanji was defeated by califa and it was nami and chopper that were there and, you know, Chopper, you know, Kumadori comes down the hallway and, you know, Chopper's like, I'll take care of Kumadori, you go take care of Khalifa and figure out a way to heal Sanji. And so Nami's like, all right, I'll leave it to you then. And so, you know, they, they very clearly, you know, Nami understands that Chopper is really strong, but he also has, you know, he's also still, he's the youngest member of the Straw Hats. You know, he has moments where he's rather sensitive and, and Nami's there to provide emotional support when he needs it. Um, so, yeah. Robin, uh, being the only other female member of the Straw Hat crew, um, at least for now, anyway, um, is uh, basically like a sister to Nami, and, and they, they're probably the ones that are the most closely connected there, you know, because, you know, it's just, you're in a crew with a bunch, it's a sausage party here, you're in a crew with a bunch of other men, you know, it's nice to have somebody that you could actually talk to and relate to a little bit. Um, and even though they didn't know each other for too long, you know, she joined, Robin joins at the end of Alabasta, and Nami doesn't trust her at first. Um, but, you know, it's like, oh, oh, don't even try to bother to mess with those men. But I know I'm, I'm on to you, girl. And then all, of course, that Robin has to do is being like, uh, oh, by the way, I stole some of uh, Crocodile's uh, treasure. And then Nami immediately grabs the bag and just like, oh, I love you, sister. How you doing? You know, so that was, that was a pretty funny scene there. Um, but even in the short time between Alabasta and then Jaya, Skypea, and then you get right into Water 7 when uh, Robin has to leave with CP9 and everything like that, Nami is broken up about that. She is crying her eyes out, very similar to how she was after the end in the events of Arlong Park when you know she's pleading to Luffy you know she's like she's doing it all for us you know she she's the one that left and she's doing this to save us and we need to save her she's gonna die and so even though they didn't let I me mean, like I don't know a month or two they've been together you know since the end of Alabaster like I said timelines are screwy in One Piece but it wasn't that long but even in that short frame of time they really you know they really got close and they really became like best friends or like sisters so uh, Nami was one of the first people to really just be determined, like, we need to get her back. And that was another big driving factor throughout Eni's lobby, uh, right when they up to the point when they get reunited. And uh, you see the scene there with uh, Chopper on Nami's back, you know, because he can't move after Monster Point. And then they get reunited with Robin and they just start crying and they're all emotional. Like, I'm glad you're, you're, you're still you want to be part of this crew. You want to be part of us. And then they kind of join up uh, Robin and Nami kind of like tag team in order to take down all the other strong Marines during the Buster call. So pretty damn cool scene there. I don't think there's really a lot of other moments beyond Water 7 and Eni's lobby with them. Um, they're usually the ones that they hang out on the ship. You know, they'll be like, while well, the other crew members are out goofing off, you know, fishing or fucking around. They'll be, you know, sunbathing or, you know, do they, you know, Nami likes to read. You know, she likes to learn about stuff because they'll, they'll be in the library studying stuff like that. Also, Nami wears glasses every now and then. And I hope she, I wish she would wear those more. I think she's really cute with the, with the, with the bifocal, like the reading glasses thing on. She only wore them like once in the manga. I think it was during Skypea. And I think she think wore them another, a few times in the anime, but that that was pretty much only very, very few and far between. But I, I, I like her with the glasses. I think they're cute. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll probably have discussions about that. Maybe that's how they bonded, you know, because Nam, uh, Robin's an archaeologist and she loves to read and Nami loves about the world. So she wants to draw a map of the world. So she would have conversations with her about the way the world is and the places that Robin's been and, you know, the stories about it and talk about maybe like, you know, like these books that they've read and they just really bonded that way. And it was just like, you know, best friends, you know, there you go. So Nami and Frankie, uh, well, obviously when Frankie was an enemy and beat the shit out of Usopp, you know, probably wasn't very fond of him. The first scene that I remember, in fact, this is one of the first, um, 
subbed episodes of One Piece I ever watched uh, when it aired. This is right around the time I got like high speed internet and I was going around. I'm like, cause I was only aware of like the four kids dub at this point. This was like in 2008. And so I was like, wait a second. One piece is like, uh, 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 it's still going on even after all these years. And so one of the first episodes I watched was an episode where Nami and uh, Frankie at the beginning of the episode, Frankie is building the, um, the Shiro Mokuba, the uh, one of the docking things for the Sunny uh, that, that is converted from the waiver that Nami got in Skypea. And Nami gets super pissed at Frankie for modifying it with, like, a horse head and everything and adding a wheel to it. And uh, so that, that's that's one of my original One Piece memories. Like, one of the very first episodes I remember watching on, like, my shitty, really, internets that, you know, buffered every five seconds. And that was, like, one of the first episodes of One Piece I saw beyond the four kids dub. So that's that. Um... You know, she still really respects his abilities as a shipwright and even uses the Shiro Mokuba later on in the story. Uh, you know, and of course, when R Frankie builds the uh, Mini Mary 2, you know, come on now. I mean, Nami was one of the original members of the Going Mary that was there from the start. So I'm sure she, uh, Frankie got some points in her eyes when he re recreated it as the Mini Mary there. Uh, during Punk Hazard, the, probably the biggest one between their characters is during Punk Hazard, they're the ones that switch bodies. Uh, Law uses his devil fruit to make sure that the Straw Hats don't escape, and he swaps uh, Chopper's, Sanji's, Nami's, and uh, Frankie's body there. Uh, you may realize, by the way, that I'm not mentioning uh, when I was talking about Sanji's relationship with Nami, I didn't bring up when, uh, you know, uh, Sanji was in her body. The way I'm going to handle this with the swapping of the body shit, and this is actually the first time this has ever been brought up because my first three, Usopp, Brook, and uh, Zoro didn't have that shit going on, so this is the first time this is actually being brought up, is that I'm actually going to talk about the characters that are in the bodies rather than the bodies that they're inhabiting. So, for instance... When we get to Sanji's discussion, that's when I'm going to talk about, you know, Sanji's sexy time, you know, that in Nami's body. But, you know, Nami was the one in Frankie's body, but it's still Nami's character, so I got to talk about that. Uh, see where I'm going with this here. Although Nami was in Sanji's body at one point, so I guess I, that's that's a twofer. But that was only very briefly that that was the case. Uh, you know, she was only in their bo uh, Sanji's body for only maybe like a few chapters before they got met back up again. And then Law was just, the, there's this moment where, where Nami was like, hurry up and switch us back quick. And then Sanji's just like, no, don't do it, don't do it. And then Law just kind of looks at him like, what the fuck? Just whatever here. And then just, and she's like, oh no, my dream has ended. And Nami's like, ah, I'm going to kill you. Um, but the first body she got swapped with was Frankie's. Uh, and her line, of course, was, I'm Nami and I'm not going to shoot beams even if you ask me to. Uh, so that, that, that was kind of cute there. Um, there were scenes where she, because she's not used to being that strong, obviously, and then you have Sanji, you know, taking peeks at her body when, you know, Sanji was in Nami's body, and, you know, she her initial urge is to, like, I'm going to freaking clobber you on the head, because she does this comic relief thing on the ship a lot where it's like, you know, whenever Luffy or Usopp are acting up, she'll like knock him over the head and, you know, it's like, oh, Nami's stronger than Luffy. Ha ha ha. You know, it's just comedic effect and shit like that. But she tries to do it in Frankie's body. She ends up like pancaking her. So everybody has to hold her back. Like, don't do it. Don't. Um, eventually Law meets back up with the crew and they, they get switched back. Uh, there's not really any really bad... I mean, that would have been really cool to see Nami and Frankie's body really doing some badass shit. Like, oh, get away from me! <laughs> like, like shooting out, like, missiles and shit haphazardly, having no idea how this shit is controlled, you know? Uh, the nipple lights probably would have been a funny little cutaway scene. You could have had fun with that. Nami basically in the body of a Transformer. Uh, but it doesn't really go, it doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't really do anything there. She doesn't, she doesn't shoot any beams. She doesn't launch any missiles. Uh, it's, it's, it's whatever. Last but certainly not least, we have uh, Nami's relationship with Brooke. Now, very much like the other members of the Straw Hats, uh, she was a little bit freaked out by that. Probably on the same level of Usopp and Chopper. Except, uh... Nami was the one, one of the first people that actually met Brooke on the ship, you know, when they arrived, you know, and her first, of course, reaction was like, eh, it's a skeleton, what the hell, and then Brooke just walks up to her very casually, and then we had the line, you know, Brooke's kind of catchphrase with Nami is, hello, may I see your panties? And then, of course, Nami being Nami, BAM! Right in the fucking socket, you know, eye socket, you know. Um, oh, that would have hurt if I had skin, but I don't, yo ho ho ho, okay, whatever. Anyway, um, so, eventually, though, of course, like I said before, pretty much after hearing the Laboon story, everybody goes along with it, although she's still a little bit, like, eh, like, after, even when she knows the story, 
And Brooke has that emotional moment where, you know, he's playing the piano at the end of Thriller Bark and Luffy's on the piano and he's like, let's jo join my crew. Nami's just like, ah, okay, this is getting kind of weird now, but whatever, I guess we'll just go along with it. Um, Brooke is seen in the same way as Frankie a lot, rather kind of, and Sanji in some respects, kind of annoying occasionally, but a really strong person that you can rely on when the chips are down, okay? Although, I have to bring this up, because I brought it up before in the recent reviews of One Piece, so minor spoilers. But, you know, you have the running gag with Brooke, constantly with Nami, like, May I see your panties? May I see your panties? And of course, Nami's like, fuck off, I'm not showing you my panties, come on now. You know, kicks him in the head. But then you get to moments, like on, uh, t in Totland, where it's like, Brooke fights a freaking Yonko, manages to not die, in fact, manages to injure that a little bit, he gets injured too, but manages to injure part of the homies of Big Mom, manages to get part of the road Poneglyph, which is, you know, part of the way to get to Raftal and the One Piece, the, the ultimate treasure, by the way, which, by the way, um, I have no doubt in my mind, like, I have no idea what One Piece is, obviously, but there's no doubt in my mind that part of the One Piece, anyway, is, like, just a massive mountain of gold and jewels and treasure. That's only gonna be part of it, but that's gonna be, like, probably the first thing they're gonna see. Is, like, all the treasure that Goldie Roger collected, so Nami is gonna freaking orgasm at the sight of that, probably. And Brooke just helped her get to that, get to that place. And so, he, he, Brooke is just like, uh, no, no, Nami says, oh, thank you so much, Brooke, uh, uh, you know, I think I can do to make it up to you, I would do it, or whatever, uh, I, you're in my debt, or something like that, and then Brooke gets an idea, like, hmm, okay then, show me your pen, and before he can even finish, Nami's like, anything but that, and I'm just sitting there like, oh, come on, Nami, come on now. He's, he's, a, he's a skeleton. He's a fucking skeleton. You know what? And I'm not going along the route of just like, oh, when a man does something for a woman, therefore they have to do whatever the man says. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying Brooke is a fucking skeleton. He doesn't have a dick. He should literally be the most innocent thing ever. You know, there's no concerns with this shit. Just, it's like, oh, freak, you showed me a pony. I, I, I can get to the One Piece. All the treasure I could ever wanted. Fuck, here, have my panties. I don't even care at this point. You know? it's I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. Brooke needs a little bit more respect than getting punched in the face or kicked in the head. I mean, come on now. Give him something. Uh, but hey, maybe after the end of the last chapter, you know, Brooke, you know, you know what he did, you know, and, you know, so... Maybe, maybe he'll get a reward for that now. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, um, okay, okay, okay. So that, that, that was the relationships there. Uh, moving on now, there's a few other ways I wanted to do this. Do I want to talk about the climb attack first, uh, her weapon, or do I want to just go straight into the tits? You know what? Let's just go straight into the tits. Let's just get it out of the way. Okay, so, um, you might be thinking right about this point, like, really, teching? Really? You're going to dedicate an entire segment of this discussion video just to Nami's boobs? You fucking pervert. Are you kidding me? You know who's bigger pervert than I am by an order of magnitude? Oda! Oda is a huge pervert, okay? In fact, in fact, let's um let's take uh words from the man himself. This is uh this is from volume 60 SBS here. Um this is the question. Is it possible for a woman to become an editor of One Piece or are all the editors of boys comics supposed to be men? You know, I thought that was a good question when I was looking through that. I'm like, "Oh, okay, cuz I love reading SBSs. I might do a whole video just dedicated to SBSs." But I'm looking through that SBS and I'm like, "Okay, that seems like a, a good question, you know, like shonen is of course primarily uh, aimed at men, uh, aimed at teenage boys, I guess, you know. So uh, would it be possible to become a female, to be a female and still, you know, be on the staff of a shonen that's aimed primarily toward uh, teenage boys? Here is Oda's response being part of this industry for many years. A beautiful babe with big knockers is fine by me. Yeah, he's a fucking perv. I mean, he goes more into detail with that, but not only that. You know, if you're an actual SBS aficionado, if you've actually looked through a lot of the old SBSs, Oda gets a lot of questions. He gets way more questions. I mean, One Piece is like one of the most popular stories in, in Shonen Magazine. In Shonen Jump, anyway. Shonen Magazine is actually something different. In Shonen Jump. Um, so you know he's going to get more questions that actually show up in the SBS, and yet there are plenty of questions that usually just revolve around, Hey, Oda, I heard you like big tits. And Oda's response to that is, Yup. So you know for a fact he's looking through these questions like that. Let's just sift out all the big boob questions and throw them in there. I know I've answered this like 30 times, but let's just throw some more in. When someone was questioning Oda's drawing style of women, 
he brings up the fact that Oda, for the most part, draws his women in a very overly sexualized way. Now, of course, there's exceptions to this, like Kokoro and Big Mom, but most of the, you know, the, the standard way he draws women are very wide hips, very thin waist, and uh, huge bust. That's, that's his typical way of drawing a woman. And so Oda's response to that, you know, query, like, oh, I, I draw women to be overly sexualized and then people can get upset by that. Um, he draws a diagram of how he, he depicts his women, which are pretty much just, you know, an X and then three circles, you know, one for the head, two for the boobs. And his response is like, you know, let's just all be ourselves or let's just all have uh, let, let everyone do what they want to do. Basically, Oda's uh, Oda's way of saying fuck off. It's my manga. I like big tits. I'm going to draw girls with big tits. That's, that's the way it's going to go. Uh, that's, that's basically what he said there. So, uh, yeah, here's the thing though. And it is, of course, it's very obvious. I mean, her boobs grow throughout the entire freaking story, uh, up until you get to like, like when she first appeared in the manga, very normal proportioned. And then after the course of like Alabasta, I'm like, okay, you're getting a little bit more sexualized by the time we get to Annie's lobby, even more so. And, uh, it's way more apparent in a lot of the movies, like in movie seven, and uh, the Alabasta movie, they're really, like, they're just all bouncy crazy. Uh, and in a few episodes, too. Like, uh, I remember the episode where uh, the Mary is burned. Uh, and that's, that, like, the, the snow falling in the sea of forgiveness and sadness and whatever. That's a very emotional episode. The same guy that uh, animated that episode or was responsible for, like, drawing the characters was the same guy that animated uh, the movie. Um, and so because of that reason in that episode, you may notice that, Son that Nami and Robin's boobs get way more prominent in that episode for some reason. Um, and you know, Oda, I mean, he didn't particularly do that, but I'm sure he signed off on it. And then, and then after the time skip, of course, you know, Oda just disregards, you know, like, okay, let's just, let's just skip over everything and just turn her into like really more or less a fan service -y kind of character, which by the way, just because you're a fan service character doesn't mean you are a shit character. You could still have... A good character development and motivations and goals and dreams and relationships and you can have a decent power and you can be a really interesting character to talk about and also be a fan service character and also be very attractive in that respect but after the time skip it was very clear Oda was just like okay I'm just gonna give her huge tits and then basically I'm just gonna change her out for a different bikini top every arc which he did throughout Fishman Island and Punk Hazard and Dressrosa it wasn't until honestly recently when we get to Totland that she starts to wear something other than a bikini top every single arc uh, but that's that's what she wore for a long time there but yeah, okay, I know, I keep getting off topic. I, I You knew this was going to happen. When This is why I didn't want to, you know, lead with this, because then, you know, we would have been talking about boobs forever. Me and Oda are kind of like blood brothers in that respect. But here is the point, all right? There was an SBS question, so this is coming from Oda's own words, where he delves into this fan service, you know, really sexualized character thing beyond just, you know, I like girls with big tits. He goes into it a little bit more detail, okay? And I'm going to read this question and his answer basically right off the wiki. Um, this isn't like a perfect translation like you would find in a Tonkoban. This is just, you know, the wiki translation, but it, it's, it's more or less gets the point across here. I'm incredibly hyped over everything about New World Nami. As the creator, do you feel uncomfortable knowing that I'm thoroughly enjoying all the Nami merchandise that's being produced and plan on continuing to do so in the future? Should I tone it down a bit? Okay, so basically what that person is saying, I mean, they, they might have had to alter that or censor it a little bit because this was going to be featured in Shonen Jump, but essentially what he's saying there is, Hey, Oda-sensei, how do you feel about the fact that your creation, uh, Nami, is uh, basically masturbated to uh, all over the world by teenage boys? And probably some teenage girls and probably some adult men and probably some adult women. Yeah, you know, people are jerking it to Nami all over the world, Oda. What do you feel about that? Um, that's basically what he's asking about here and enjoying the merchandise. Like he's probably talking about like docky markers, like body pillows and figurines and all that shit. This is Oda's response to it. It's a little bit long, but here you go. I feel like Nami's popularity has been skyrocketing these days. Could it be because she makes more appearances now? Hmm. Anyways, I suppose you're feeling a bit guilty because you're looking at my characters with lecherous eyes. This is just my personal opinion regarding all characters that I've ever created. But in all honesty, it doesn't really bother me. One of my own great teachers told me once, everything within the world of manga is pretty much just merchandise. Nobody within that world is real. And it wouldn't be very professional of a creator to get offended over whatever a customer decides to do with the goods he has bought. 
I noticed this with a lot of other creators, and this doesn't just deal with manga, this deals with anime in general, or video games or movies. I, I, I see a lot of characters getting pissed when it comes to uh, taking their characters and altering them in fan fiction or in cheese or making them more sexualized or something like that. A lot of creators get really pissed by that. Like, like I know Miyazaki got really pissed about that whenever uh, people were using uh, like uh, Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service in like a sexualized way. And Miyazaki's like, oh, she was she was so pure when I created her, and then the internet got a hold of her and changed her into the perverted. You know, he got really pissed about this. But Oda Ode is basically saying here that he doesn't find that professional. That's his personal opinion. He feels like these are characters I'm creating. They're not real. They're basically just to sell merchandise. Oda goes on to say this. You're free to your own interpretations, fantasies, and any other methods of enjoyment. It makes me happy just knowing that you even care to follow along with my series at all. Okay. So, that's the way Oda put that. He doesn't care about people over-sexualizing Nami in fan fiction or in Daojinchis or all the merchandise involved. So where does this loop back around? Because Nami is fucking profitable, bitch! Oh yeah, she makes all the money rain! So, that's where it comes from! Get it? She loves money, and all this freaking Nami merchandise that exists in the world is generating a shit ton of money. Nami is literally making her own fortune. There you go! Maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's part of the joke. You know, how, you know, Nami is so obsessed with money, and, you know, her products and stuff like that, like, here's a sexy Nami action figure, here's a Nami uh, body pillow, here are those Nami mouse pad things where you can rest your wrist on her breasts. You know, that's, it's, it's all that. It's all that. So, it, it really, it just, when I, when I, you know, I, I mean, I, I could have realized this beforehand, but when I was really making this video and I was like, shit, Nami's all about money, you know, she's got the, the Barry uh, belt buckle after the time skip, you know, she's obsessed with money, and um, it's because of her, her her appearance and how, you know, how sexualized that Oda makes her that she not only sells a bunch of merchandise, but is also, um, I, I see her at the top of, like, a lot of, like, sexiest anime women of all time or sexiest women in manga. She's always in the top top three um so yeah that's where it loops back around tad she's she's more than just a pair of tits though you can be profitable and you can have all this sexy merchandise and you can be a fan service character and you can be more than that and i think that's what nami really represents you know it's that she she's not she doesn't have any scruples with that she'll go around wearing nothing more than a fucking bikini top you know, in, in, a, in a situation where you really should, you know, that's no whatever, and, and a pair of lowrider jeans, but she just doesn't care. You know, she's, she's, hell, she's confident about her body. She's fucking hot, you know? And, and, and you know, there's scenes, plenty of scenes where people are like, uh, you know, how she gets her bounty posters, how her bounty posters are always, like, sexual. You know, I can't do it. Why did I even bother trying to do that? Like, oh, yes, hi there. You know, like, that's the reason. You know, someone wants to take a picture like, oh man, you're gorgeous. Let me take a picture of you for this magazine. And she's like, oh, if you insist, just make sure I look, uh, I, I just look pretty. And that's how she gets all our bounty posters made for her. Um, so that's that. But, you know, she's, she's more than just that. Like I've said, I spent, I must have spent easily over just a half an hour before we got to this point talking about her body to the point where we like, she is a valuable member of the crew. She's a very interesting character that goes beyond just um, a pair of fucking triple D knockers, okay? So, um, wait, 90, 98 centimeters, in case you're curious. And I mean, I think this just comes down to the fact that Nami is just one of the most recognizable and most popular characters in the series, just in general. We're doing a popularity poll pretty soon, so I would assume that Nami's probably going to rank in the top three easily. But just going beyond the popularity poll, look at it this way. All the different episodes that they do, that the special episodes that the anime does, uh, which ones have we had so far? Well, we've had episode of Luffy, episode of Sabo, episode of Mary, which all touch upon very important characters in the story. You know, Luffy being the main character, Mary being the, the ship that the Straw Hats rode on, one of the most emotional scenes in the entire story. Uh, Sabo is a character that just appeared after being gone for so long, so a little bit more introspection into him. But the other episode of story we've had was episode of Nami. They're could have easily been like an episode of Zoro or Sanji or something like that but no we get episode of Nami first bitches 
Moving on to Nami's weapon, the Climb Attack. All right, so as I said, uh, Usopp created the first uh, Climb Attack, the first version of it, which was little more than just a party favor thing. Uh, three different staves, uh, one of them, uh, they can be all connected together, but each of them, when you blow into one, can create a different uh, temperature of, a, of an air bubble. So the first one creates uh, a cool ball, the, first one uh, the second one creates a heat one, and the third one creates an electric ball. And uh, using you, you have to have like a mastery of the weather to really uh, understand how these work. But combining these different bubbles together, Nami can create miniature clouds and lightning strikes, and she can create mirages of herself. Not really how mirages work, but she can do that because she's awesome and it's a manga. Her ultimate technique in this form, because there's a lot of useless techniques here, like, uh, you know, ones that just, like, shoot out a pair of, uh, like, flowers and stuff like that. But her ultimate technique is Tornado Tempo where uh, she, like, these two cuckoo birds pop out, wrap around the opponent, and then the it spins really fast and then just pff, blows out and then sends the opponent flying, which is what she used to defeat Mrs. Doublefinger. Um, it came in handy one more time against Eneru, when Eneru was shooting a lightning bolt at her, and Nami used the electric ball thing to create a ball that, when the electricity hit it, it guided it away from Nami. It redirected the lightning. Um, but then Eneru realized, oh, okay, all I have to do is just ump up, uh, amp up the voltage and then you're good. Amp up the voltage. That makes sense, because amps and voltage are two different things. When, you know, I'm going to shoot you with a bigger fucking lightning bolt and you'll die. You'll be turned to crispy bacon, girl. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's 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 uh, very uh, very limited in that technology. Although, after Skypea, after Usopp gets dial technology, he combines that with the climb attack, creating the perfect climb attack. This is the weapon that Nami used during uh, Annie's lobby to rescue Robin and how she defeated Khalifa. Basically, the same abilities as the former one, except there's no more party tricks involved it's just a straight up weapon uh so the electricity and the heat and the rain and stuff like that like the old rain tempo was just like nami holds out each of the you know the the, the things and then just like like a human sprinkler it's kind of funny but this one will actually create like an entire squall in the area that you use it in and uh, nami uses a lightning rod technique to finish off califa there and her ultimate technique in this form is the fata morgana where she can create different uh mirages of herself where she can actually hide in any of the mirages that she wants, distorting her own image, you know, the light reflecting off, refracting off, like, the, the, the fog, that mist that she creates. Um, the next version of this, we didn't really get to see a lot of what it could do, but after she trained on Weatheria, after she got sent flying by Kuma, she got sent to a sky island called Weatheria, and, uh, she trained with a sky wizard guy named Haridus, and, uh, there was different technologies that adapted there, like the weather balls that they could grow, and uh, over two years, she created the Sorcery Climb Attack, which is basically like the first one, except it doesn't have holes. It was just like a single staff kind of thing. And using that, she could uh, do things called like Weather Egg. Like you can shoot out like a little egg that'll crack open and then like a cloud will pop out and like shock everybody. And uh, Gust Sword, it was like a, like a fucking wind blade thing she could use. Uh, this doesn't get that much screen time because pretty much uh, Usopp takes to modifying it right away and that's when we get to the fourth uh, rendition of the climb attack which I don't think actually has a name I don't think it's been given a name but uh, uh, Usopp gives it to her on Zo, and it has all the same functions as the sorcery climb attack and all the functions that you had beforehand save for one there was like a magic wand sort of uh piece of technology that usopp just couldn't wrap his head around that um you know the the, the the weatherians created so nami still probably has that extra weapon on her to use and he couldn't incorporate that into the climb attack but nami's climb attack now uh, is combined with like the pop green technology that you know usopp had on bowen island so nami I mean, come on now. I mean, Oda's kind of laying it on thick here, but it's literally a large phallic object that kind of resembles a dildo a little bit, and then Nami squeezes it, and then it gets longer. And in the anime, they just went completely crazy with this. They had her, you know, you know, right up next to her tits and going in between her tits, and it's just like, okay, okay, calm down. There are, there are kids watching, good sir. Do you not think of the children? That's something else I gotta bring up. It's just great when you look at the differences between cultures because Nami, I mean, One Piece airs on like an early morning child block in Japan, like Sunday mornings, like for children to view. There is no way in hell that Nami would be allowed to appear on like that same block in America dressed like this. 
you know, with the boobs all over the place. You know, just standards and practices just would not have this here for children's cartoon shows at like eight in the morning. So that's I just find that funny in different cultures. Uh, but yeah, that those are her main weapons. And of course, like I said, adapting her knowledge of the weather increases the lethality of these objects. We haven't really seen her use the new climate act all that much. She used it like she can actually use it as a blunt weapon now. Like she can extend it and actually hit people with it on top of using the same techniques that she had before with her sorcery climate attack and stuff. And I'm waiting to see what the uh, that magic wand thing that Usopp was talking about was that 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 one piece of technology that Nami got from with area that uh, Usopp wasn't able to understand. It was probably something very magical and we're probably going to see maybe at the end of this arc, maybe at the end of Totland we'll see Nami bust that out and see what that's all about. Nami not being one of the main fighters in the Straw Hats, I mean like she can hold her own, but she's not one of the main fighting forces. Doesn't get into as many fights as most of the other, you know, Straw Hats do, like the, you know, the Monster Trio and even like Chopper and Usopp. Nami doesn't get into that many fights. In fact, actually if you want to just break it down, she probably gets into the least amount of the fights in the entire story. Because even, like, you know, Chopper might be seen as weak, but he's pretty strong. You know, uh, Robin, I think, isn't getting as much spotlight as she deserves, but she gets into some fights, too. So it's probably probably Nami that gets into the least amount of fights, and she'll usually end up fighting, like, an underling or someone that's, like, not one of the stronger members. Like, during Skypea, she uh, has an encounter with Satori's brothers, Hattori and Katsuri. So not one of the priests, but members that are part of that uh, that group. Um, but be, she, like, she's very intelligent, so she's good at thinking on her feet. Like, with Eneru, she knew that she had no way of fighting Eneru. Like, don't even try. You're not going to win. So just play around, play play with it, and just like, oh, yeah, I've always wanted to go to Fairy Verf. And so kind of, like, just following Eneru lead and acting like she's like 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 oh I'm just gonna follow you I'm I'll screw the straw hats whatever I'm just gonna go with you here because she doesn't want to die um but with that being said Nami's uh fights that she's been in the first major fight she's ever been in in the story aside from just like random underlings and stuff like that uh or you know any, any encounter with that was probably during Mrs. Doublefinger during uh uh, the uh, Alabaster arc. I'm just waiting. I'm just looking back really quick here. She had a fight with um, like Mrs. Valentine's Day during Little Garden, like where she popped out of the cake thing and she's just in a bra and she's like knocking people back. Um, but uh, it wasn't at the end of the day. It was like her and Vivi as like a collaborative effort that helped out there. Uh, and Zoro took out Mr. Five, of course, there. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't really until Alabasta that she had like a one on one fight, no holds bar, no one's coming to help you. You have to win this. And like I said, she used the you know the the claim attack there to actually fight because before that she just had like a normal staff that couldn't actually you know really hurt any of the stronger opponents. Um, during Eni's no during Skypea she fought against Hatchery and Kateri. During uh, Eni's lobby she had another serious fight. She fought against Khalifa there, which I feel like uh, that's another thing too. People seem to underestimate her a little bit because she does seem weak and she does. I guess it's easy to look at Nami and just think of her like as a uh, like oh you're just a you're just a, a beauty. You're just a just pretty girl that just expects everyone else around you to fight your battles. You can't actually fight, and uh, she proves them wrong. You know as with Khalifa there, I think Khalifa was really underestimating her a little bit, and that led to her getting a fucking lightning bolt through the fucking heart uh, <laughs> um let's see after that we have thriller bark which oh side note with her outfits uh nami changes outfits probably more than any of the other straw hats you know maybe next to like robin and stuff like that uh and probably my favorite outfit that nami's ever worn was her first uh well her second thriller bark outfit the pink one with the crosses i love that outfit and the frills and uh she doesn't wear it for all that long she only wears it for a few episodes before you know absalom you know kidnaps her and shit like that and she the wedding dress is cool too but my favorite outfit is the the thr the, the pink thriller bark one with the crosses i thought that was a neat aesthetic compared to like they're going to thriller bark which is like this horror like this you know horror show of an island and you have the crosses on it i, I like that i like that appearance there um what was i talking about yeah thriller bark uh thriller bark she has this scene where she fights absalom even though she's she she beats absalom but she he was already weakened during the fight with sanji so it's like one lightning bolt from nami was enough to drop absalom but it wasn't like a serious fight that she really won um she contributes in the fight with uh oars yeah she's you know tactical there um saba ondi she fights against some members of the auction house not really really hard hitter members of course um during the time skip she seems to get more confidence here in that respect she doesn't run away from battles as much. Hell, in the first scene of uh, when we see her after the time skip, she has a gun held to her head by the fake Nami on the on the fake Straw Hat Pirates, and she doesn't even 
you know, she doesn't even flinch. She's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. You have a gun to my head. Yeah, you're Kappa Riggler, Marmy, whatever. So she, she's gotten more confident in that respect. Uh, but it's still, like, she's not going to jump into the fray, though, because during Punk Hazard, you had the moment with her and Usopp that were like, oh, as long as the enemy is flying away with their back turned, then we will take action. But in that, in that moment, they were fucking cool. You know, Usopp does the freaking pop green shit and knocks down Buffalo, and then Nami launches a lightning bolt that just strikes both of them. I mean, that was pretty fucking cool. So if Nami had a little bit more confidence in herself, I could see her taking down not big opponents. Like, let me put it this way. Nami, as she is now, could probably easy contend with, you know, like the, the initial, uh, war, uh, initial pirates in the East Blue that were a problem. Like, she could deal with Buggy, no problem. She could have dealt with Don Krieg, probably no problem as she is. Hell, here's the big question. Do you think current Nami could take down Arlong? What do you think about that? That's that's a tough one. That's that's a border for me. But, I mean, it, it, she, she would hurt him, certainly at least a little bit. The problem is that she's completely reliant on her weapon and her athletic ability. She's pretty agile, too, of course. Um, but... If she gets hit, you know, she gets hit. She gets injured. That's the main problem. She doesn't have a lot of durability in that respect, you know. Um, I mean, she has built-in airbags, but I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, so, you know, if, if she, you know, you know, lightning bolts and, like, crap like that, she's really strong and she can summon air swords and stuff. But if she gets hit, then she's down and she can't really get back up after that, right? Uh, although, I mean, hell, she did resist getting stabbed multiple times by a freaking knife. And, uh, and, and I think that she suffered another injury. Didn't, didn't she get, um, oh man, I seem to remember at one point in the story, she suffered some injury where she got shot or stabbed somewhere else on her body and she can still move. I, I forget what that was though. I might be thinking of like, am I thinking of Reiju? No, I'm, I'm pretty sure she got hurt at some point too. Nami, well, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So, uh, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about her character. This is probably the longest goddamn episode I've done easily. Probably even longer than Zoro's. Uh, what, what, oh, yeah. One more thing I wanted to talk about. I didn't get across. Her, her tattoo. Yeah, her tattoo. Um, she had the Arlong tattoo. She stabbed it. And then, you know, the doctor couldn't completely replace it. So she replaced it with uh, another tattoo, which was a uh, tangerine and a pinwheel. Com there we go. Combined together to make, like, rep reminiscent of her of her home island, Genzo and Belmere. And... Uh, and to live on through Bellamere's kind of, like, uh, dream there. No, but not, not really Bellamere's dream to be a pirate or anything like that, but Bellamere always wanted her to fulfill her dreams, and so that's, that's, that her, Bellamere's dream is for Nami and her children to grow up, not, I'm, I'm, okay, let me rephrase this, I've been talking for too long. Bellamere's dream was for Nojiko and Nami to live out their dreams. So there you go, that's what you have. Okay, well, I think I'm good, I think I'm done here. Man, that was that, that was a long ass video. I am not looking forward to editing this shit. But I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you like the the content anyway. Um I love setting these things up as you can tell. I mean, I got the map of the world back here. I got my I got my booty. Um thanks to the person that sent me this Nami figurine too. This was this was nice. Uh so yeah, and the uh, the oranges which I will now enjoy. Uh tangerines. Sorry. Uh, but thanks for watching, and next time we're going to be taking on this is just the luck of the draw. I didn't plan this. Next episode will be, uh, Robin. Probably my favorite female, my favorite female character in the entire One Piece story. You know, I, uh, I like Robin. I think, I think that's pretty obvious at this point, so I'll try not to be too biased with that, though I probably will be. So, uh, catch you back here next time, guys, talking about Nico Robin, the Devil Child. Signing out.